welcome to this public worship service held at St John's Presbyterian Church, Annerley, with our resident pastor, Reverend Martin Duffield, ministering this evening. As is a habit, we commend to your prayerful concern those of our church family experiencing some distress. We are now encouraged to engage in personal preparation just prior to our call to worship. Thank you. gathered to meet with our God this day to worship him and we're going to do so called from the 99th Psalm this morning and uh, this evening uh, and uh, verses 1 to 3. Psalm 99 verses 1 to 3. The Lord reigns and let the people tremble. He dwells between the cherubim let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion and he's high above all the peoples. Let them praise your great name and awesome name. He is holy. Let's do so as uh, we respond to his call, our call to worship by bringing our prayers of adoration to him this morning. Let's all pray. Come, O oh God, to sing the praise of your name and to give you the honour that belongs to you as our Creator and our Father in heaven. We acknowledge we are but servants and unprofitable servants at our best. But we come because we delight in offering our lives in work to you, the work you've given to us day by day. We praise you for this great privilege which makes us even the most mundane labour that we have, a high and a holy calling. Because we know we labour as your servants on earth and in heaven. What a privilege it is we have to see and to know this, as you have revealed it. We praise you also for the revelation of yourself as a worker, as the God who worked and rested in creation for our pattern, but whoever works to bring about your glorious purposes for the great works of creation and providence, the works of redemption and restoration. We praise you for the beauty of all those works, whether it is in the glory of the cosmos or the genius of the microscopic world, the forming of man from the dust of the ground or the renewal of man from the death of the soul through the power of the spirit, through the giving of life in the beginning and the resurrection of life at the end of history, all these works praise your name. And there is none like you for power and for wisdom. So accept our praises this evening, we ask, through the blood of our Lord Jesus. Work mightily in and through us by your Spirit in this hour and in the week to come. And accomplish the good things <coughs> that you will for the benefit of your people, and for those who are not yet your people, and all to the praise of your most holy name. For we ask it in Jesus Christ's name. 
Amen. Have you not known that number 28 in Rejoice is our first hymn of praise to God this evening? Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 12 to 26. Verse 12. Then I turned myself to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do who succeeds the king? Only what he has already done. Then I saw that wisdom excels folly as light excels darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head that the fool walks in darkness. <clears throat> Yet I myself perceived that the same event happens to them all. So I said in my heart, as it happens to the fool, it also happens to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in my heart, this also is vanity. For there is no more remembrance of the wise than of the fool forever since all that now is will be forgotten in the days to come. And how does a wise man die? As the fool. Therefore I hated life, because the work that was done under the sun was distressing to me, for all is vanity and grasping for the wind. Then I hated all my labour in which I toiled under the sun. <clears throat> because I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will rule over all my labour in which I have toiled and in which I have shown myself wise under the sun. This also is vanity. 
Therefore I turned my heart and despaired of all the labour in which I had toiled under the sun. For there is a man whose labour is with wisdom, knowledge and skill, yet he must leave his heritage to a man who has not laboured for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. For what has man for all his labour and for the striving of his heart with which he has toiled under the sun? For all his days are sorrowful and his works burdensome. Even in the night his heart takes no rest. This also is vanity. Nothing is better for a man than that he should eat and drink and that his soul should enjoy good in his labour. This also, I saw, was from the hand of God. For who can eat or who can have enjoyment more than I? For God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to a man who is good in his sight. But to the sinner, he gives the work of gathering and collecting that he may give to him who is good before God. This also is vanity and grasping for the wind. And to God be all the glory. Amen. Let's uh, come now to confess our sins to God as it relates to our working life. Let's pray. Our Saviour God, just as our work is a gift from your hand, so too is the power to do that work and even the power to enjoy the benefits and fruits of that work. More than ever today we know how quickly a job can be lost how wages can be cut, how health can be taken away at your will. And we do well to remember these things because sometimes our attitude to our labour is less than you would find acceptable. We can be guilty of not treating it with the respect it deserves and the energy and the body of mind that it requires. We can fail properly to prepare for it by having late nights and by not taking due rest especially on the Sabbath, which you have given to us for this very purpose. We also live among a people who at times work harder at their play than their work, filling their weekends with things that actually make them less efficient to be able to labour in the following week. We recognise your people can fall into this trap too. Help us therefore, we pray even as you forgive us for these sins, to stand back and to consider carefully all that we have at work in its rewards and our health. Give us wisdom to live as you would have us live and to be conscious of your will day by day, not just on Sundays. Prompt us often to remember that all work is done for you and all rest should be to assist that and to promote its effectiveness. Bless us with sweet sleep each night, as the proverb says that the work, sleep of a working man is sweet, so, and that, that it is the reward of those who do work diligently and hard, and who can be pleased before you with what they have accomplished. Help us, we pray, with our workers, with all things, to labour to the glory of your name, for we ask it with the forgiveness of all our other sins in Jesus' name. Amen. Hymn number 199 is next with which to praise God. A man once came from Galilee, 199.
here a second passage from the Word of God on the subject of work for the believer, and it's in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 to 25. Verse 18. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleases, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. And again, to God be all the glory. Amen. Let's now take a moment to meditate on God's goodness in this past week before we come to thank him in our prayer of thanksgiving. Father, we give thanks to you gladly, as we give from our treasures gladly. We know it is used by the church and we are happy that this is so, but we give it with a promise and commit it as given to you and to you alone. And to you and to you alone we wait upon you for its heavenly return, both in our personal lives and in the life of this congregation and its generosity. Money in our world can be put to work. So put this heavenly money to work on earth as we offer it for the eternal kingdom in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. But sing again to God's praise, uh, 464 a charge to keep our health.
come now to the Word of God, but first of all, this evening, let's take a moment to pray. Let's all pray. Our Lord and our God, we thank you for this day of rest that you've given to us. We thank you for the, the gift of worship, the opportunity to still meet with you, to, to gather in with your people in one in spirit, even if we cannot be one as a congregation. We, as we come to the subject of the Christian and work tonight, we do pray for your help to understand the things that have been written for us, that we might be continually reformed in our approach to the whole of our lives as Christ's Lordship extends itself into our working life. For those who know these things, may we be refreshed uh, in our reminder of the wonderful principles, practices and um, priorities that are associated with the daily labours that you've called us to engage. So help us to understand these things we pray in our Lord Jesus' name. Amen. So um, I'm going to read to you just a couple of verses from Titus to not this evening, um, just to uh, so that we know what we're speaking about, as it wasn't in the main readings. And it's Titus chapter 2, and just verses, uh, verses 9 and 10, because it deals with the subject of labours, although it's under the general call of, um, of bond servants, or um, slaves, as it's sometimes unfortunately translated now. So it's, it's uh, Titus chapter 2, and it's just verses 9 and 10. It, Paul tells Titus to exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, not, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Saviour in all things. Amen. So that is the portion that we have to read tonight, um, from which our sermon is taken under the heading, The True Christian Employee, um, which includes the life and the testimony of the employee. So as the Apostle continues to counsel Titus on how the church members should behave themselves, he turns in these two verses to bond servants. The importance of addressing this lies in the fact that this relationship was not only common in the ancient world, but lesser forms of it exist today in terms of the practice of hiring labour. Every time someone takes a job, job they hire out their labour, their bodies and their brains, if you want to put it bluntly, to work for their employer. Bonded servants were people in a much less free and sometimes much less pleasant arrangement. A modern employee has many more options than an ancient or even a modern bond servant. But there are useful principles that apply to both free and not so free servants in ancient or modern times. Before I begin, I would make the point that I don't use the word slave. I avoid this word because it's full of nasty associations with the most brutal and inhuman servant-master relationships, especially the African slave trade. However, as anyone who really knows about what is called slavery, the condition of slaves or the bonded servant varied greatly throughout the world just as it did throughout history. And just by the way, Paul's call here and elsewhere in the New Testament for slaves and masters to behave properly in brotherly love and with respect for each other's stations in ancient Roman culture was no more a support for the or a support for the inhuman slavery practices, um, as former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd so wrongly asserted, than Paul's call to obey lawful authority in Romans 31 to 7 was a support for the mad and violent behaviour of the emperors like Nero. Nonetheless, this was a sensitive matter that Paul raised in those times 
because he knew, as did Peter, that the life of bond servants could be very difficult, as Charles Ellicott explains in his commentary. Indeed, the repeated warnings to this unfortunate and oppressed class tell us that among the difficulties which Christianity had to surmount in its early years was the hard task of persuading the slave that the divine master uh, who promised him a home if he were faithful and true among the many mansions of his father meant not that the existing relations of society should then be changed or its complex framework disturbed. St. Paul knew that it was a hard matter to persuade bondmen, fellow heirs of heaven with free men, to acquiesce patiently in his present condition of misery and servitude. Hence, these repeated charges to this particular class. These poor sufferers were to obey cheerfully and readily, as the next clause told them. Charles Ellicott. So with those words of introduction and explanation, let's turn now to the actual councils which apply equally in practice and principle to those who serve others, whether they sell their labour to them or volunteer it at no cost. We will see that they will be called to be wholehearted, they were actually to be protective of their masters, they were to demonstrate personal integrity, and in it all, they were to strive to bring honour to the faith or the gospel. So let's begin firstly with the matter of wholeheartedness. All Christians who serve should have this exhortation as their overarching claim in serving others, as recorded in verse 9. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them. Why do we work? Why do you work? What drives you? For some it is the desire for wealth, either to accumulate wealth or to pay off the debt of that uh, wealth. It is all monetary motivations for such people. For others, the work brings personal satisfaction, not only in what they accomplish, but in actually doing what they do if they enjoy it, and of course not all do. All of these motives and many others could be called self-serving motives. They're not necessarily wrong. When we come to the Christian approach to service, especially paid service, we have two other motives, glory and the pleasure of God. And we shall speak more of the motives in a moment, but the scope or extent of our commitment to labour is submission to those we serve in everything. It is a call not to resist any lawful direction as required by those over us. Remembering that no authority is absolute, therefore, outside of lawless demands, whether illegal or immoral, Christians in service are required to submit in all things at the very minimum. Being willing to do more than asked is not excluded by this call. We have the concept of the extra mile in the Gospels, though in a different context, that of persecution. But nonetheless, it is a way of responding, and many people in service do this anyway when they are concerned for more than simply their wages at work. There are a number of expressions of obedience to highlight this, and I believe I have mentioned them in the past, but I'll deliver them again as follows. One, there is willful disobedience which is a deliberate resistance and refusal to obedience. Secondly, there is unintended disobedience, an agreement to obey, but then followed by failure. Thirdly, there is reluctant or compulsive obedience, what we might call unhappy compliance. Fourthly, and they're getting better, there is compliant obedience, which is military or dutiful compliance. The fifth one is glad obedience, which is pleasure in obedience. And the sixth and the most admirable of all the obediences is unsolicited obedience, which is to do, which is to obey in something that is not required, nor asked, but still needed. So that is the full spectrum of attitudes to and expressions of obedience, from the very negative obedience, in disobedience, to obedience without being asked, and all in between. The call of the true Christian servant is to comply. 
Further, coming back to those two motives, the Christian servant is compelled beyond self-interest to each slave to be subject to their masters in everything and try to please them. It is for the pleasure of the one over the servant. We may ask the question as to why we should try to please an employer or some other person for whom we work, and we will have the answer for that from the Protestant work ethic in, in a moment. But Scripture, the Holy Spirit, and God himself therefore say that we are to work to please those over us in our labours. It is a question we should ask at least occasionally, especially when the one over us is not themselves pleasing to us. Under such circumstances, this is counterintuitive. It goes against the grain to please people who don't please us, but God gives us this exhortation or command through the Apostle to serve in this very way for the pleasure of those who employ us in that service. That is the goal or the aim. We can ask of anything we do, therefore, is this pleasing to my employer or those whom I serve? Total compliance, accompanied by that altruistic goal of causing pleasure in those whom I serve. Well, before I move on, I would remind you of the second motive, one of the texts that is the basis for the Protestant work ethic. It is Colossians 3, 23 and 24, as follows. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ whom you are serving. So here is the great motivator for a truly regenerate man or woman. Here is the great motivator for a believer, that what you do is done because you have an inheritance from God in eternal life, and because you know that it is Christ, ultimately, that you serve. Not only do we serve this Christ when we serve anyone over us, but we also imitate him who said of all that he did in John 8, 29, The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. We know that we exist to glorify and to enjoy him. But it is also true that we exist for his pleasure. It is analogous to the joy or the pleasure that children give to their parents, that students give to their mentors, when they do what they have been asked and taught to do. When you think that your work is drudgery, when you wonder if you're accomplishing anything, bear this in mind. The work we do in serving others is pleasing to God if it is done for his glory and for his pleasure. However, the altruistic or selfless considerations of our work that we do, we do it for others, also takes into consideration their wider interests and well-being as Paul now counsels Titus. The servant must be protective of those whom he serves. So we're considering now not just a whole heart in our approach to work, but a protective attitude toward those whom we serve. The witness of a servant and an employee is enhanced by how they treat the master or employer. Two very common sins against such people are here mentioned, disrespect toward them and theft. One steals honour, the other steals property. Paul warns of servants, they are not to talk back to them, they are not to steal from them. In the case of the first sin of talking back to an employer, it could be said that the master has given a direction the servant doesn't like, or that the master said something which offends the servant like criticism. The Greek word literally means to against speak, whether it is to refuse to obey, or as is more likely the case, to argue, or to criticise, or to insult the master, it matters not. All such speaking is forbidden by God through the Apostle, as Albert Barnes explains. He said, It may be observed, however, that all that is here said would be equally appropriate, whether the servitude was voluntary or involuntary. 
man who becomes a voluntary, voluntarily a servant binds himself to obey his master cheerfully and quietly, without gainsaying or arguing, without attempting to reason the matter with him, or propounding his own opinions, even though they much be, may be much wiser than that of his employer. He makes a contract to obey his master, not to reason with him or to instruct him. I have known many people who have thought themselves wiser or cleverer than their employers and who sometimes unwisely told them so. The result was predictable. Dismissal eventually or resignation. And one of the problems here is the old problem of pride. But in the case of harsh masters or employees, sometimes backchatting or argumentativeness is because of the unreasonableness of the employer involved. But this passage makes it clear that no such confrontations are acceptable to God. He is the God of order and not the God of chaos. Uh, and, all, all, uh, and he is the God of all human society. As you've heard me say often in the last few sermons from Titus, the order of human society depends upon the existence and the maintenance of just authority. Conflict. The sowing of dissension through backstabbing, the spreading of dissension are disastrous for any organisation. And if you are privileged to work for an organisation, you should work to maintain its order and its peace. In so doing, you help maintain its productivity and its harmony. The workplace needs to be a pleasant place, at least as much as it is possible. And the tongue can be the cause of so much trouble, as James warned in chapter 3, and the first 12 verses. It has the power of life and death and many lesser potentials for good and evil, as Proverbs 18.21 reminds us. Now a second matter comes before us in terms of protecting those we serve and their assets is the prohibition against pilfering or stealing. There are those who steal from their employers for the following wicked justifications. They think, one, it is a big organisation and they won't miss it. Two, it is a big organisation, they can afford it. Three, I deserve more than they pay me, so I'll take the difference from the stores. Or four, they rip off their customers, so I will repay them in kind. Sometimes it's just plain greed and temptation. It is, of course, a straight breach of the commandment, you shall not steal, number eight. All property, remember, is someone's property, whether the owners or the shareholders of a business. God has said we are to acquire wealth by only three means. One, by labour. Two, by trade. Or three, by gift voluntarily given to us. To acquire assets by any other means, without the approval in one or other way from its owner, is just theft. The law requires us not merely to not steal, but to protect others' property. Scrupulously honest people do protect others' property and will return that which is lost or pay what is undercharged. They recognise they have no right to that property because no con contract has been agreed to allow the passage of the right ownership of, from one to the other. Theft can also take other forms, of course than what the wicked sometimes call the five-finger discount or walk-away prices. In the workplace, stealing can be turning up late or leaving early or exceeding the given length of break times. It is stealing of an employer's time uh, for which ultimately uh, the employee is paid. We agree in the contract to provide labour and to do so between set times. But there are other ways too in terms of poor health and in distracting others from their work that our employers, that ancient masters were denied uh, what they were due. All these things are recognisable forms. Now, these are all behaviours that astute owners and employers recognise as theft. While many will cut employees slack because they know at other times those same employee, employees will work extra hours and put in extra effort, when it only goes one way, it is theft, 
even if the lazy, selfish and unconcerned worker does not see it. But as Christians, we should be scrupulously careful about our employer's time because it is money to him. We should do as the Catechism explains regarding the property of such people and protect it in every way possible, including ensuring that not only labour is worthy of the wages, but the wages are worthy of the labour. This leads us very naturally into another aspect of the relationship that is trust. Our attitudes as Christians, which the employer, apostle requires, touch our personal integrity and our usefulness. The first of two goals of the Christian worker, employee and servant, paid or unpaid, is to build or maintain trust. The apostle said that slaves are to show, or bond servants are to show that they can be fully trusted. Charles Ellicott again explains some history behind the issue of trustworthiness on the part of an ancient bond servant. And I quote, It must be remembered that many of the slaves in the Roman Empire were employed in other duties beside those connected with the house or the farm. Some were entrusted with shops, and these being left often quite to themselves, of course provided great opportunities for dishonesty and fraud and were constantly present. Others received an elaborate training, and as artists or even physicians worked in part for their masters. A, a bond servant in the days of St Paul had a hundred ways of showing his master this true and genuine fidelity, opposed to mere assumed surface obedience and service. Charles Ellicott. So you see how what is popularly called slavery is, was sometimes a little different from what we would call employment today. Such bond servants had sometimes great responsibilities. They were managers and administrators, public servant type roles if you like, or corporate management. However, even as the house servant and the farm worker were still required to develop trust with their owners and masters, they were handling others' property, sometimes much of that property. We are reminded of the pattern of both Joseph and Daniel in their situations. Both these men were found trustworthy and were promoted as a result. It is another goal of the work in our relationship with others, and especially those over us, that we can be trusted, that people can rely on us to do things, to handle their wealth and their money in particular. The Apostle Paul speaks to this in 3.22 of Colossians. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything. And do it not only when their eye is on you to curry their favour, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Ronald Reagan's comment about the man who doesn't care who gets the credit, being able to accomplish an enormous amount, has added incentive with this, because they know they please God. They live with an eye to God. They care not about what are the opinions of others. They get their satisfaction in knowing that God sees, that God knows, and that God is pleased. And there can be no greater thought than this for um, incentive. Did you know that under the current tax law, apparently, minister, ministers of religion in particular are regarded as literally, quote, employed by God? Well, there is a real sense that everyone should think that way, no matter who pays you. We live and we work for his pleasure. And if Colossians 3, 22 to 25 is properly understood, we work for his reward. Herein lies part of the power behind the so-called Protestant work ethic. The only work ethic that comes close to providing the inspiration and incentive uh, outside of the person in any culture for working is the Japanese work ethic but not all of its motives are healthy, even if they are effective. This is the driver of trustworthiness. It keeps a worker honest, focused, reliable, and faithful in all his requirements of labour. God is watching, even if the boss is not. God is pleased or displeased, even if the employer or master knows or knew nothing. Such workers press value into the businesses and the workplaces 
They are valued and they should be highly prized because few outside of the Lordship of Christ, few people have such external motives driving their honesty and their reliability. But if no one else does, the professing Christian must, if he or she truly sees God in all that is done. It is a mark of true regeneration that God now becomes the great motivation for everything seen and done in the life of a Christian worker, or in this case, the ancient bond service. Servant, sorry. This brings us to the final matter of concern for, from the counsel of Paul, and that is the good name of God. A truly Christian approach to labour beautifies the gospel, honours the church of Jesus Christ, glorifies God, and that should loom large in every Christian's mind who works for another. So let's talk lastly of the beautifying of the gospel by our paid work or voluntary work. Paul gives to Titus the reason for this call to work in such a way as to generate trust with those over us in our work, so that in every way, he says, they will make the teaching about our God, about God our Saviour, attractive. We are, I trust, all keen evangelicals. We long to see others here and respond to the good news that there is peace with God, that through faith in Jesus Christ and repentance from our sins we can be saved. However, we have to earn the right to speak, as 1 Peter 3, 1 to 15 tells us. Here is but one way of bringing about such a soul-saving conversation. You cannot disconnect the gospel from the Christian life. There are those who would say, just get to the cross. But scripture doesn't speak like that in terms of our witness to others and its effectiveness. It keeps life and doctrine together. And I am not alone in this, by the way. John Chrysostom says this of the matter from the 4th century of the modern era. He said, and I quote, Greeks form their estimate of doctrines, not from the doctrine itself, but from the actions and the life of those who profess the doctrine. The non-religious today are looking for the same light and salt. Common grace enables them to recognise honourable people and pers the personal beliefs that produce that honourable behaviour. Jesus Christ, where he is known, is understood to be the epitome of goodness and mercy and truth and love. And when his people reflect that same high standard of behaviour and character in the world, it brings the same admiration and interest that Christ himself stirs in those who may learn or know of him. Remember, he has set us a high standard, but he has given us a great help by freeing us from the guilt and the penalty of sin through his cross, through the help of the Spirit who has broken the power of sin in us, and through the word which has enlightened us as to his perfect will in everything, whether great or small, in the fellowship and the love of his people. It alone can beautify the gospel and make it welcome in the lives of individuals to whom who are exposed to it. Paul is telling Titus that what you practice speaks louder than what you preach. It starts speaking long before you open your mouth or before your employees, employers and workmates open their mouths to ask you to open yours. As a faithful Christian employee or a servant of others in organisations, paid or unpaid, you must adorn the gospel that you seek to share with those around you to obtain the blessing of God. Um, upon that approach, as all obedience does, is the great goal of service. The early church, remember, had favour with its Jewish culture for these very reasons in Acts chapter 2, 41 to 47. The integrity, the high ethics, the unselfish concern for a master in ancient times was part of the reason for Christianity's spread. It still is, and it always will be. Let's come to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are called to work while it is still day. And this work is the business of revealing to the world in word and deed your power and your glory. So help us to live as holy people amidst a crooked and perverse generation 
with an attitude that reflects your own righteous nature. Help us to work as they're working in every sphere of our life, including home and the church, as though we are working for you, and in such a way that we might continue to draw men and women, boys and girls, to yourself and our great Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. For we ask it in his name. Amen. We're going to sing now to God's praise. Uh, Jesus calls us o'er the tumult, 466. Thank you. 